Tonight, we have past president of the Howard County Bird Club, Kevin Heffernan, who will update us on the status of butterflies in Howard County for the fifth year in a row. Kevin is the co-chair of the Howard County Butterfly Survey is, and is encouraging the planting of native pollinator gardens as part of the Howard B City Pollinator Committee and the Habitat Creation and Enhancement and Pesticide Reduction Subcommittee. He has certainly helped my pollinator garden over the past couple of years. So thank you, Kevin, and we're looking forward to talk tonight. You can be there, you can be here. I, I can do it if you don't mind. I don't mind. Okay. All right. Well, good to see everybody. I had to get directions on how to get here. It's been so long. <laughs> <laughs> So the talk tonight's about the uh, 2022 Howard County Butterfly Survey and the results of that. Um, to start, we have a couple of photos and they're just awesome photos. The Harvester by Anna Moore is one of the best Harvester photos I've ever seen. And the uh, the 20 Emperor overpositing, I mean, 20 Emperor is a really tough butterfly to find anyway, but to find laying eggs. And look at the diamond pattern that it's laying the eggs in. And of course, it's, that's Kathy Litzinger, whose name you're going to hear many times in the next hour or so. So let's get your feedback from that. So okay. So either okay. face that way or move that way. A okay. Bit. All right. Next slide. Okay. I'm going to start by dedicating this presentation to Linda Hunt, who up until last year was the co chair of the, of the survey. Um, she worked with Dick from 2014, 2015 on doing the data. And after Dick passed away in 2016, just took it over and uh, kept it going for several years. I, I didn't get involved in 2018. And with her combination of indomitable spirit, work ethic and people skills that effortlessly draw people in. Um, she stepped down this year uh, from the detailed data. Um, you know, um, let's see. Don't, uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. So, can you? Oh, I'm sorry. Get yes. Rid of that? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Detailed data gathering, and, but it's really active still, leading walks and talks, and, and also she turned into most surveys this year of anybody, of course. So, that's really part of her legacy. So, but you can't do something this big without a lot of people and a lot of help. And a uh, special thank you goes out to Kathy Litzinger, who took over Linda's roles in the organization. and um, in, in the data collection side. And without her, this, this survey just wouldn't happen this year. Um, another huge thank you to Bob Solom, who provides the tools needed to get the data from the email to the spreadsheet where it can be analyzed. He also deals with walk announcements, photo gallery, trip reports, and a host of other things. And we hosted seven butterfly walks this year in the leaders that make the walks happen. So another big thank you to Woody Merkel and to Annette Orr, who led several of the walks and whose expertise made the walk special for participants. And Kathy and Linda co-led them as well. Next slide. So this is a list of people that um, contributed this year. Um, we had the highest number of people contributors in the nine-year survey this year uh, it was over 100. Um, a lot of that was because of the seven walks that made a difference. I'm not going to read their names, obviously. But you can probably find your name on there. So next slide. So I decided this year to put together a chart of the number of surveys that each person put in, or at least the major uh, people put in. And uh, you can see, of course, Linda Hunt led it with 186. So when you think about it, there's 214 days between April 1st and October 30th. She pretty much sat out the rainy days, and that's about it. Um, and Clayton had 173. Um, so, and you can see the the top six people had 50 percent of the survey. So you can just get a sense of that. And I, I, uh, I cut it off at 75 percent. Uh, so basically, it was like the top 12 or 13, maybe 14 had 75 percent of them. So, um, so way overdue. Thank you to Clayton for the number of surveys and photos that he has put in every year. Raise your hand, Clayton. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's awesome. And another way everybody really thank you to Jim Wilkinson for his multi-year contribution to this. And we haven't mentioned him and we should have because you can see he's fourth again this year in terms of number of surveys he put in. 
So there were 1,044 surveys submitted by 104 people. And there are multiple names on some of the same surveys, so it raises it to 1146. And you know, six people submitted half of them. So I went through that, so I don't need to do it again. But thank you to all 104 people who contributed to the survey this year. So next slide. I'm going to skip over this one. This is just an outline of the talk. So this is a big slide here. It's a nine-year overview, and you get a sense of what we've accomplished here. We started with 22 observers in 2014, and this year we had 104. So um, that ranks first. The number of surveys, we have you know, got over 1,000 again this year for the second year in a row. Um, basically, the highest number of observers, the second highest number of surveys, and duration in the field participation in the survey is strongly growing. Um, the, uh, the old, that 116 number of total, total observers, disregard that, that's an old number, and it's gonna take me a while to go figure out the right number. I'll do it, but I hadn't, didn't have time to do it for tonight. So the 80 species, um, the highest number of any year is 75 in 2016, and that will probably never happen again. I'll talk to that in a few, another slide. We've seen greater than 195,000 butterflies in nine years. So we'll see 200,000 next year. Um, the amount of days allowed us to plot flight times. This time last year, I said I was going to plot flight times over the winter and do early and late dates, and we did get that accomplished. Um, the 388,935 minutes is equivalent to 6,482 hours or 162 40-hour weeks, so more than three years worth. So pretty amazing. Next slide. So some highlights. And I have way too many words on here. I talk fast, but you know, if you if you fall asleep, I'll try to wake you up. So some highlights: 70 species seen, no new species. High counts for 12 species, and second high counts for another 12. So one third of the species seen had higher second high counts in the nine-year survey. And low counts for four and second low for five more is so 13% uh, on the low end. Did not find dusted skipper for the fourth year in a row. We're, we're concerned that that one's extirpated from the county at this point. Mount Pleasant, yet again, got a new species, zebra swallowtail, um, again, found by an animal work. Who else? Um, we only found one long tailed skipper, mulberry wing, and hackberry and fruit this year. So with three species, we only had a single individual. Um, between 2015 and 2021, we had 11 harvesters in county total in those seven years. This year we had 14. Um, great spangled fruit numbers have continued to drop. American copper, common check and skipper, toddy eggs are species to be watched. Silvery checker spots and white ebon hair streaks continued their strong showing from last year. Last year was a big year for them and they did it again. Uh, after two down years, broadwing skipper more than doubled his previous peak. If you remember last year, I was concerned that we wouldn't see any of this year, um, and uh, they, they turned it around. We've had more pipeline swallowtails and zebras for the first time in the survey. Um, first time northern cloudy wing numbers exceeded southern, at brown numbers in 2022 exceeded the total of the previous five years. Seven butterfly walks published all those things. We'll try to publish host plants and possibly update the butterflies at Howard County this winter. No guarantees on that, but we'll try. And then continue to work with BC. So next slide. So this is number of butterflies seen by species. And you can see that six of them were over a thousand individuals. Um, the top by Sachem at 4894. Um, it's going to be either Sachem or Cabbage is going to be the top one every year. Last year it was Cabbage by a bunch and Sachem took over this year. So we have um, another 22 species between 100 and 1,000 individuals reported. So next slide. And then we have 30 species between 10 and 100, and 12 species at less than 10. So you, you can get a sense of the distribution. Um, and three species, of course, only had one. So next slide. So here's a percentage that each one had. I, I took it out to one anything that was above 1%. So basically, the top four got 50% of the individual butterflies, and you, you got the 20 and you got 90%, and the other 50 were 10%. So you can see the, the kind of skew in the number of uh, individuals per species here. 
Okay, next slide. So I presented this last year, but I think I updated it so it's a little more clear this year. So in terms of the number of species you might get in a given year, um, we have 61 species that we've seen in all nine years. So that they're pretty much, not necessarily a lot, but pretty likely to see them every year. And there's seven species that we've seen either seven years or eight years. And the two we've seen seven years, we've seen them in the last seven in a row. So pretty likely we're gonna see those as well. So that brings your total of 68. And if you look at the ones in purple, there's six of those that we've only seen in one year. Um, so pretty unlikely we're gonna see them in any given year. So now you're between 68 and 74. And those orange species are the ones that are gonna tell you what you're gonna pretty much determine how many you're gonna get in a given year. And this year, if you look at the 2022 column, of course, we got all the green ones like you'd expect, and we got two of the orange ones, so 68 and two, so you end up with 70. That's pretty much the way it lays out here. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide. So the, uh, we had a dozen species with um, high counts, um, northern clouding wing, um, cracked 20 this year with 22. Ours is dusky wing, which surprised me. I didn't see that one coming, but pretty significantly higher than its second highest one in 2019. Um, Southern Broken Dash had a ridiculous year this year. Um, and Little Blasty wing, again, another one I didn't see coming, but. Uh, Significantly higher than second place. So next slide. Hobo Oak Skipper for the second year in a row had a good showing, um, 35 this year. Broadwing Skipper I'll talk to in another slide by itself. Spice Bush Swallowtail hit 500 for the first time. And I'll talk about Harvester again in a different slide as well. So next. Banded Hair Streak, um, we had 51 or two this year. We knew this was going to be a good year when in one of the butterfly walks we had at Mount Pleasant, we had more on that walk than we had the entire year last year. Um, and that happened in both of those walks at Mount Pleasant. So more than 50 of those, so that's a big deal. White M hair streak, if you remember last year, um, that was the butterfly of the year. We had 24 of them last year and we matched it this year. So two years in a row for that one. Um, morning cloak uh, with 33 matched its high in 2016. And Viceroy um, at 45 was uh, pretty significantly higher. Well, I guess higher than last year by maybe 10 or so. So next slide. So we had 12 species with second high counts. Um, um, I, you know, common city wing with seven doesn't seem like a high count, but that's a really tough one to find. Um, fiery skipper, Dunn, black swallowtail. Giant Swallowtail, first time we've seen it since 2019, so that was a big deal. Um, tiger, Sleepy Orange, which started out really slow last year, but then came on late summer and fall. Um, I won't read the rest, but you can, you can get a sense. So I'll have a slide on Monarchs later on as well. Next slide, please. All right, so the low count. Um, common Checkered Skipper, um, I think we had like 14 of them or something like that. It was really, you can see now it's dropped five years in a row. Um, and 20 edged is, you know, basically gotten a lot lower and this was the lowest we've had it. So it, it was running like 27 or 28, something like that. Gray Spangled Freight, again, four years in a row of low numbers. That's a real concern at this point, not just in Howard County. And Hacker Amper, we only had the one, I think that's just, people not getting out to the hackberry trees, mostly at Mount Pleasant. So next slide. And we had five with the second lowest, long-tailed skipper, southern cloudy wing, falcate orange to American copper, which stopped its five years in a row of dropping, but only barely. I think it had 16 this year, as opposed to like 12 last year. And then Pearl Crescent, that was kind of a surprise. So next slide. So common checker, Skipper, basically, again, you see that in the western part of the county most of the time, and not a lot of people are out there surveying. So its overall conservation status in Maryland is S5, so it's secure. Um, and we're just seeing real drops in, uh, in Howard County. Uh, 20 inches has dropped for four years. It's, again, considered common in the state, but we need to keep an eye on it. And American Copper, uh, same thing as uh, common checker, more of a western half of the county's um, species. but we used to see that at Mount Pleasant pretty routinely, and we haven't seen it there for like four years now. So something's going on there. 
Next slide. So fertile areas, historically, we've had five of them in the county. And uh, I've always wondered about Regal and Silver Border. Um, we saw we had Regal, Silver Border, and the three we still have, Great Spangled, Variegated, and Meadow. So the Regal fertile area suffered severe range contraction in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And the last one seen in Maryland was in the early 90s at Fair Hills Natural Resources uh, Management Area in Cecil County. And Dick Smith turned out had five records in Howard County um, in the Maryland Biodiversity Project. So can you imagine seeing this guy up in the upper right in Howard County? What, what a cool looking butterfly that is. So right now in the Mid-Atlantic, there are two populations left. That's how much it's contracted. There's a real small population in southwestern Virginia and the managed population in Fort Indian Town Gap. And they have an open um, invitation for people that want to go there a couple of weekends in late June and early July every year. It's worth signing up for to see these guys. They're really spectacular. Silver border also used to be found in Howard County. Dick had one undated record uh, in Maryland Biodiversity Project. And in 93, when he updated his butterflies of, of Howard County, he had it as uh, rare extirpated, so it was already mostly out of the county by then. Same thing in 2000, by 2012, it was extirpated. So it was probably one of those, you know, 70s and 80s as well as the regal as well. So next slide, please. So the Great Spangled um, is the one we're concerned about. You can see the distribution by year on the lower right. And their numbers tend to wax and wane. Um, the current hypothesis is that global climate change may be problematic for fertile areas because they might miss the violent connection if either the flower or the butterfly appears on the landscape too early. So it's got a weird life cycle. Um, and this is from David Wagner in uh, Caterpillars of the Eastern United States. He says, the life cycle of our large fertile area seems ill-conceived. Adults mate in June and July. The male comes out early, or female comes out like two weeks later. The females lay eggs in the fall and only rarely bother to place in one mile of leaves. The first instars hatch two to three weeks later, drink some water, and they don't eat for seven to eight months. They go down to the ground, spend winter in the ground, and then in the spring upon awakening, they go find new tender leaves of a violet and start eating. And of course, few of them survive the winter, as you would imagine. The picture down the bottom is a first instar, great spangled four. Great Spangled caterpillars first in store, they're a twelfth of an inch long, and they're trying to survive the winter without eating for that many months. So, but nature's compensatory. The fertile areas are most fecund butterflies with some species laying over two thousand eggs, so they kind of get around it. Uh, but it may not be working so well right now with climate change. So, if you need a reason to leave your fallen leaves this autumn, this is it. If you remove them, you're just killing these tiny caterpillars. The next slide. So silvery checker spots, um, this, in 2020, we had 32 of them and we were ecstatic. Um, we made it to butterfly of the year and we were super embarrassed the following year when we had 246 of them. <laughs> Mostly found by Kathy Litzinger at um, Ilchester Elementary on a Jerusalem artichoke as a host plant. Well, they, they obliterated that area late last fall, and we were really concerned that they weren't going to come back this year, but they did. We had 170 of them this year, same location mostly. So that's good news. And the, the question is, how many other pockets of diversity like this are in the county? You know, we found one, there's got to be more. So part of what we're trying to do is find places like this for these types, types of uh, really rare up until the last two years. Um, individuals. I mean, up until 2020, the highest count was 12. So, all right, next slide. One other thing on that slide. Um, Kathy brought silvery checker spot cats home and raised them on some of her plants and actually got them to be closed. So, we got our first picture of a silvery checker spot chrysalis. It's in, on the website now. Okay, now next slide. Thank you. So, broadwing skippers. Um, we went through this last year. It was first found in the county by Alan Lewis. Like Alan in 2011. It was a new county record at that point. People were surprised that it was away from the edge of the bay. Um, it's been found every year in the survey, but real low numbers. 
between 2014 and 2017, the only person in Solon was Kathy Litzinger, and almost all of them were in her yard. And in 2020, they blew away the Phragmites that near her home, and that's what they use for host plant. So we only found two in 2020 and one in 2021. And I stood up here last year worried that we wouldn't see any of this year for the first time in the survey. And of course, we found 25. <laughs> so basically, on June 24th, Kathy and Linda found 10 of them on, at Meadowbrook on the milkweed right next to a patch of fried bunnies. Another six were found later. Wilkinson found six at Gateway. And Kathy and Linda, of course, found them in their gardens as well. So we went from the concern of losing them to having the largest peak numbers of the survey in one year. And that's the beauty of a long-term survey. It always surprises you. By the way, this photo on the on the lower right, there's three of them on that milkweed flower. That's equal to the total number we saw in the county in 2020 and 2021 together. So, all right, next slide. All right, we haven't talked monarchs on this talk for the last few years. So I thought it was worth putting a slide in, particularly since the International Union of Conservation and Nature labeled them as endangered last year. So the eastern population of monarchs shrunk by 84% between 1996 and 2014. That's pretty serious stuff. But the number of monarchs in our survey, as you can see from about 2017 on, have remained pretty stable. 2018 was a huge peak year, but the, the rest of the years from 2017 to 2022 have been pretty stable. So that's good news. Um, in the, we had 1,937 in 2018 and 934 this year was second most. But one thing I wanted to point out is we actually have eight pollinator meadows planted and maintained by Howard County Department of Rec and Parks. And they're all registered as official monarch butterfly way stations through monarchwatch.org. And they participate since 2010 in the effort to provide monarch habitat, tag and recover tags, and, and along, along these migrant, migrant, you know, monarch migration routes. So next slide. And here's a list of where the, um, these meadow sites are. I'm not going to read it. Um, I'll, I'll be putting people to sleep if I do that. But there's like 64 acres of meadows out there that Rex and Parks have put together. So pretty impressive. We're going to ask uh, Brenda if she can mow um, paths through some of them so we can actually get into the middle of them and, and try to you know, find butterflies in there as we go. So we'll see how that works out. But Kudos to Brenda for putting this together. This was mostly her doing this. Uh, so really impressed. So the next slide. So we've had seven butterfly walks between June 22nd and September 4th. The first six were at Mount Pleasant. The last was the Dick Smith Memorial Walk at Elkhorn Garden Plots. We averaged 20 people per walk and 23 species per walk. The two walks in June, we're doing pollinator week where we found the, the coral and banded hair streaks. They were the, the the two species that we were really shooting for. August 20th, we had the most people, 26, the most species, 33, and the most leaders, five. So not too many times you get five leaders leading a walk. And by the way, the most number of species that Karen and I have ever had at Mount Pleasant is 28. So that, we, that got eaten uh, pretty handily on that walk. And we played have a similar number of walks this year as well. So the next slide. So I presented this last year, but I want to get a little more specific this year. So, you know, azures and spring are always problematic. Years ago, if you saw an azure in spring, it was a spring azure. And if you saw an azure in summer, it was a summer azure. And when one switched to the other was always a question. And then the lepidopterists got a little more serious about it, realized there were multiple broods of summer azure, or a single brood of spring. But the first brood of summer azure came out earlier than the spring azure did. So now you got spring azure and summer azure out at the same time, and they're damn near impossible to tell apart. So a sighting is only considered a spring azure if it's verified by an expert, which is pretty much Harry Pavilion, because I can't tell them apart. Um, most azure sightings in early in the year then are recorded as azure species, as you can't really tell. And probably 99% of them are that summer azure brood. But if you can't tell, we're going to be conservative to call it azure species. So the question is, what date do you make? Do you, do you switch over to all summer? And um, basically, if you look at the flight times plot here, right in mid-May is when that thing drops. So you know that the 
spring azure flight and the first route summer azure is done by then. So we're saying all azure sightings up until and including May 14th should be entered as azure species, unless you can definitely ID it. <clears throat> and, and after May 15th on, they should be entered as summer azures. So try to be a little more specific with that one. The next slide. So one of the things we put together last year was the overwintering strategies of the butterflies in the survey. So I use field guides, online data, survey data to research the strategies. And the best field guide for this turns out to be the butterflies of the Atlantic. So the categories include <clears throat> egg, caterpillar, chrysalis, adult, may overwinter as adult, unknown, migrant, or induced or introduced on vegetation. So both caterpillar and chrysalis phases were given in different references from five species, peck skipper, cladded orange, sulfur, American copper, red bait, and hair streak. And we, we, did, we put both of them on the list in that case. So 55 of the 80 species overwinter in the egg, caterpillar, or chrysalis stages. And many of those overwinter in the leaves. So once again, leave the leaves. Only three overwinter is egg in the egg stage, bronze copper and coral banded hair streaks. And three overwinter as adults, morning cloak, uh, comma, and uh, question mark. And they can be seen flying on winter days, warm, warm winter days. So an additional five species may overwinter as adults, or sulfur, sleepy orange, American snail, variegated fruit, and American lady. And a majority of these individuals, of these five species, migrate south. But some of them are sticking. Um, and sur the survey data play a part in the may overwinter as adult designation for orange sulfur, American snail, and variegated critical area. Basically, because we saw orange sulfur really late in December, we had a variegated fertile area in mid-February, and we've had American snail in mid-March. So some individuals of 22 species migrate north and south during the year, and one species, the other one in strategy is unknown, mulberry wing. And one species was designated as migrant and introduced on vegetation, dainty sulfur, because in 2019 they came in on vegetation, but in 2012 they actually had a a migration year up here, so we actually did see them in county. And then there's a PDF of this on the website. So next slide. So possible sources of error, we're, we're looking at this. So diff, you know, skippers, difficulty ID in them, butterflies in out of the way habitats, so lack of people getting there. Early spring butterflies when there's few garden nectar plants. Errors in identification, so we check, we check reports before we put them in the system. So if something looks funky, we question it. We encourage people to send photos if they're not sure of the ID and we check versus early and late date. So um, one of the interesting early late date things when I would put that together last winter is somebody put in a Hobomoke skipper in mid-August and you know they're done in June basically. And I thought, who the heck did that? And of course it was me. <laughs> <laughs> early on when I didn't know better. So. Um, so we usually, um, for rare butterflies or one that are outside the early late dates, we require a photo to count it. Uh, double counting of rare species, coral hair streaks a couple years ago at Mount Pleasant. Um, Annette found 10 of them there at one spot. And Karen and I went the next day and found nine. And Kathy Litzinger went the following day and had eight. And lots of those were probably double counted. And we're going to try to eliminate that in the future. And we've done some of that this year. Um, and daily garden counts can result in double counting. So we're requesting that garden counts be put in every week, but give the peak in any one day of each species instead of the total. Okay, next slide. So the one location can make a difference. We've had this slide up here three or four years in a row because Mount Pleasant seems to have one species to its list every year. And this year it was zebra swallowtail found by an edelweir, of course. And uh, so we're up to 68 at this point, and we pretty much um, guessed last year that the next one that would be at Mount Pleasant would be Zebra Swallowtail, and we were right. We have no clue going forward at this point, because <laughs> what's left, there's 12 species that are left, four are very rare, seven are rare, and one is uncommon, and several of them require habitats that aren't present at Mount Pleasant. So it'll be a real interesting find the find the next new species at Mount Pleasant, maybe several years from now. Next slide. Uh, Kevin, can I interrupt for a moment, please? Sure. 
Uh, it's Kurt. Uh, what is the ho host plant for zebra swallowtails? Is pawpaw, isn't it? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And there, there are several of them on the, uh, you know, on on the conservancy uh, property. And uh, we got photos of a uh, pawpaw sphinx uh, larva there, so that would explain perhaps the the zebra swallowtail there. Right. Yeah, and, and we knew that, Kurt. That's why we thought zebra would be mixed there. Um, also, I had a zebra at my house for the first time this year as well, and I'm not that far from Mount Pleasant, so I, I thought it was just bound to happen. So thank you for that. Uh, they actually found a, cater a zebra caterpillar there, Rick Borchette found a, a zebra caterpillar there this year as well. Mm -hmm. So first butterfly of the year. Um, what I've got here is for each year I have the date. So the ones in blue are morning cloaks, the ones in green are commas. Um, John's variegated frit in 2020 is red, and the yellow one we had both the question mark and a comma on the same day um, last year in 2021. So the first butterfly for 2022 was a comma found by an Lor at Western Regional Park on February 21st. On February 23rd, the second butterfly was found, also a comma at Henryton. By an Lore. On February 27th, the third butterfly was found, which was a morning cloak at Rockburn, found by an Lore. So Annette owned February this year. She got all three of the butterflies in February. Okay, next slide. So the last butterfly of the year. So we've done this the last two years, I guess. It can't be a cabbage. The rules are it can't be a cabbage. You must submit a photo and an incidental butterfly report. And it can't be one of us involved in actually operating the survey. So I can't win it, Linda can't win it, Kathy can't win it, that kind of thing. So the winner this year is Bill Hill, who found a common checkered skipper on the yellow cone flower at Sun Nursery on November 12th. Mm -hmm. Now remember, we had very few common checkered skippers this year. So it was pretty awesome that that was the last butterfly of the year. And Bill's going to get a copy of Butterflies in the Mid Atlantic by Robert Blakely and Judy Gallagher. So, the last incidental butterfly report that was put in was by Linda, of course. But we had one sleepy orange, two eastern tail blues, and a pair of pearl crescents in a PDA uh, on November 29th. I have a question. What sun nursery? Which one? Um, well, it has to be, the, there's only one in Howard County. County. Yeah, County. Yeah, so it had to be in Howard County. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm working for it. Kevin, yeah. repeat the question, please, for the people. Oh, okay. So um, I wanted to know which sun nursery it was found in. And I believe there's only one sun nursery in Howard County. Yeah. So it had to be that one. Where? I, I don't know where so it is. Down 144 and then yeah. Yeah. Road, yeah. to the west. Oh, okay. You know where the uh, Heinz is? No. <laughs> I don't go that way. <laughs> okay, next slide. All right, I'm going to go through a bunch of photos here. One of the things we do is we, we show photos from uh, you know, all the people that contributed. Um, not all the people, but many, many of them. So first one's entitled, It Must Be Tough to Be a Butterfly. And the one on the left is a monarch that got caught by a dragon hunter dragonfly, which is an awesome dragonfly. Not so awesome for the monarch, mm -hmm. but a really neat picture. I, I've never seen a, a, a dragon hunter in person, so this is really cool for me. And the one on the right was a pair of sleepy oranges mating, which I took at the pollinator garden, at the community garden in Mount Pleasant. And I was a little bit irritated because of the shadows on the butterflies. It's not a great shot and all that. And I took it home, I put it in Lightroom, and I looked at it a little closer, and I saw that one of them was hanging from its chrysalis. So, so what probably happened here is the female came out of the chrysalis and before she was able to fly, it was found by a male and mated. So, yeah, I mean, it's got to be tough to be a butterfly. Yeah. So next slide, please. So the upper left, there's a female sachem that Karen Blum caught, and she thought it was looking kind of funny there. And I pointed out that it's got, it got caught by a crab spider. You can actually see the white crab spider on there. It's one of the better pictures I've seen of a crab spider catching a butterfly. Um, Homo Skipper by Pam Perna. I mean, Pam's a really good photographer. She, many of hers are in here. The, the single long-tailed skipper seen this year by Jim. Um, 
Giant Swallowtail by Connie McRill, who I've never heard of, but it was on one, one of the Facebook um, groups, and Kathy Litzinger found it. I got in contact with her, asked her to send me the photo and to send in an incidental butterfly report, and she did. And that became one of the three giant swallowtails that we saw in the county this year. So that's pretty awesome. Um, just a ridiculously good 20 emperor shot by Annette. And same thing with Carl Hair Streak, you know, they're a tough one to find. That was one of the less than 10 this year. And another Pam Parnas shot of uh, pipeline swallowtail, another great shot. Next slide. So Meadow Frit by Bonnie Bazilia. You don't see them in gardens very often. So this is an unusual photo. Um, so a pair of cloudless sulfurs by Kelsey. Thank you, Kelsey. On uh, cardinal flower, great shot. Um, great hair streak. Um, Linda's giant swallowtail in her garden. And that same giant swallowtail ended up in John's garden um, a few days later. So. Yeah, we live we live on opposite sides of 29, and but we could tell by by looking side by side at the pictures at the notches on the wings if it was the same butterfly. Yeah, so we end up we had four people see giant swallowtail butterflies, but we only counted three for the survey for that reason. So we're trying to do a little better in terms of double counting. An awesome red spotted purple shot by Clayton, and then a juniper um, hair streak by Annette next. Um, Kathy's silvery checker, checker spot, Pam Perna with an American copper, not Cooper, um, or blue mist flower, uh, which again is in a garden. That you, again, you don't see that butterfly in gardens very often. Spice bush by neck, as, as well as a female zab skipper, near, near the pearly eye by Bill. And uh, interesting, this lower right, Barbara White, White sent us in and apologized because she didn't get the ventral view of this guy and she got a dorsal view. And until we told her that's near impossible to get, they never opened their wings and she caught it flying. So what an awesome shot that is. Next. So one of the broad wings by Linda, another, another pan the shot of a little with Sater. I had a pipeline in my garden, uh, a Eastern comma by Clayton, a red, red banded hair streak by Annette and uh, a cross line skipper by Pam. Next, uh, fiery skipper on one of the walks. Um, one of the few great spangled fritz we had this year by Annette. Um, swarthy skipper by Annette. Southern broken ash um, by Linda. Question mark by Clayton. Clayton is seems to get the commas and question marks every year, and they're always good shots. Mm -hmm. And then El Cabo skipper by Annette. Next, and finally we try to get caterpillars and chrysalises and overpositing shots. So we had a variegated frit cat by Kathy Caverly, a question mark. And that was on uh, a hackberry tree by Annette. Again, a silvery checker spot shot by Kathy and a 20 um, emperor overpositing. And then Clayton got a pair of Eastern tail blues um, mating. But the one I want to point out is the upper right. In common sooty wing, we had the largest number we had all year, all, in whole survey this year, seven, a whopping seven. And she caught one over positive. I mean, how awesome is that? Next. So I'm gonna switch gears here a little bit and get into gardens and different things you can do to help butterflies. I, I, I did a lot of this last year. So some of it is, is redundant, but I think it's worth repeating and I've added some stuff to it as well. So here's the problem, or at least one of the problems. So 96% of our birds raise their young with insects, mostly caterpillars. And our insects are not able to eat non-native plants because they haven't, they don't have the adaptations to eat them. Caterpillars in particular need native host plants. And a 2018 Smithsonian study concluded that in areas made up of less than 70% native plant biomass, Carolina chickadees will not produce enough young to sustain their populations. So think about that. There's your line in the sand. You need 70% native, native plant biomass. At 70% or higher, they can thrive. So Mount Cuba did a study of 14 local nurseries between New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia in the mid-Atlantic and try to figure out what percentage of natives, non-natives, and everything that they sold. And the answer was 75% of the species that they sell in these are non-native, which don't help caterpillars and pollinators. 19.3% are native cultivars and hybrids. And many of those are 
you know, basically morphed so that they're more compact, they have bigger flowers, they have double flowers, they, you know, they bloom longer, et cetera. But a lot of them lose their pollen, you know, their pollen and nectar capability. An example of that is over here on the right, there's a New England aster purple dune, which I, I had three of them in my garden two years ago. They were stunning. They're two feet high and circular and just these big purple flowers. I didn't see a single pollinator on them. Nothing went to them. So I dug them up and gave them away. Mm. Um, so be really careful picking out native cultivars and hybrids because many of them don't work. Also, 2% are invasives and another 2% are on the invasive watch list. So, so Bee City and the Bird Club put together some tools to help. We have the, the power pollinator plant list here. We have a native plant pollinator garden templates, which we'll show you in the next page for different sun and soil conditions. And then a garden design spreadsheet, which is two pages from now. So next slide. So there's a bunch of these on the Howard County Bird Club website for you know, sunny, um, part sun shade and then um, wet, moist or dry conditions. Next. And I put together this spreadsheet that has way too many <laughs> plants, trees, shrubs, vines and grasses, and I'm still adding to it. Um, the beauty of this is you figure out what you need and you can sort on it. You get all the plants that fit your needs basically really quickly instead of doing a lot of research. So Mount Cuba actually just uh, released a similar spreadsheet. So um, at least somebody else thought it was a good idea. So that's good. And these are available on the website? Yes. Yep. OK, next. So landscape for caterpillars. Um, so a single pair of breeding chickadees that we talked about requires 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to raise a single clutch of young. So you think about that. Those are busy birds for those few weeks. So consider planting keystone trees, shrubs, and plants again on the next slide. And then here's a list of some of the host plants for some of the butterflies that we've seen in the survey that um, you could consider planting in order to get caterpillars in your yard. The more caterpillars you get, the more butterflies you get, and the more birds you get. Okay, next slide. So these are the keystone trees, shrubs, and herb herbaceous plants that uh, Doug Tallamy put together. And you can see, uh, on the upper left, oaks have 534 species of caterpillar used that as a host plant. Think about that. And uh, so you can see most of the host plants for caterpillars are trees and shrubs. Um, the you know the uh, perennials are much lower in terms of number, although goldenrod is 115, so it's nothing to sneeze at. Uh, but seriously consider when you're putting in trees and shrubs, looking at this list and consider putting in those as, as you know, if you can. And uh, Howard County has a Trees for Bees giveaway that's coming up um, at uh, Greenfest in April. So think about signing up for that as trees and shrubs. Okay, next. So leave the leaves, I've mentioned it a couple of times, so I'm gonna mention a little more detail here. So at least 57 species of butterflies overwinter in the egg, caterpillar, and chrysalis stages, and most overwinter in the leaves. So leaving the leaves and stalks is just as important as planting and nurturing natives. You know, they're not litter, they're food and shelter. And the the, the uh, red-banded hair streak um, goes on oak leaves, and when the oak leaves fall, mostly in the spring, they eat that oak leaf as their first meal. Um, so we already talked about great spangle for Larry uh, caterpillars. Um, there was another study done at the University of Maryland that showed that the number of emerging moths and butterflies are reduced by two thirds in areas where the leaves are removed. So it just give you a sense of what you're doing there. I still need to find out whether you can blow them into your garden or mulch them or rake them. My gut is if you're doing that, you're probably destroying chrysalises as a, as a minimum. So I'm gonna do more research on that. You'll probably see a version of the slide next year as well. So you tend to your garden, you avoid pesticides, you give them flowers and place the nest, and then you throw out the butterflies and you work so hard to attract it. So that's the bottom line. And there, leaves are also effective mulch, additional insulation against bitter cold weather that can um, protect newly planted perennials. The butterflies and bees have to raise the fall in the spring and successfully thrive. So I talked about the luna moth in the upper right um, that hides in a chrysalis in amongst the leaves. It's really hard to find. 
We talked about the red band and the great spangle. I want to point out this bottom middle photo. Maniac found a harvester chrysalis a couple weeks ago, right around where the caterpillars were in Rockburn Park. It took her many, many days and many hours of each day in order to find this one chrysalis. First one ever found in the county. It's freaking amazing. Only body. No, the chrysalis is this piece right here. I'll show a better photo of it um, in, in a couple slides here. So next slide. So lawns. Um, they're monocultures. They're a biological desert. They occupy 45 million acres or 23% of urbanized land, three times the size of New Jersey. One irrigation on the East Coast accounts for 30% of the water use. They're the largest irrigated crop in the country. Six Americans use 600 million gallons of gasoline every year in lawn maintenance, and one hour of grass cutting equals 100 miles worth of auto pollution. Lawn care requires chemicals, pollutants, toxins. They end up in our streams and waterways. Fish and aquatic life are poisoned and killed, and 40 to 60 percent of fertilizer ends up in surface and groundwater. So, the question is, would you rather have the yard on the left or the yard on the right? <laughs> yeah, and these are um, cow repairs. Which are, um, you know, which are now on the no-no list, basically. Bradford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bradford pairs or calorie pairs, the same thing. Yeah. Next. So some of the things you can do is want to mow your lawn less frequently, every two to three weeks, and let the, leave the weeds in there. Um, a recent study explored the effect of different lawn mowing frequencies. So lawn mowed every other week, the bee abundance increased, and every three weeks. Twice as many flowers, increased bee diversity, lowered overall bee abundance, which was interesting, versus an every other week strategy. Mow it to not less than three and a half inches. Consider rotating which part of your lawn you mow each time. So leave part of it high, you know, mow part of it, and then reverse it the next two weeks away. Um, and of course, the, the real key is reduce the size of your lawn by converting it to a pollinator garden or a meadow a little bit at a time. And each of these results in less water, gasoline, chemical uses and time, and more flowers, bees, and butterflies. And this is a great spangle for Larry laying one of its eggs in my yard, actually, not next to a violet. <laughs> All right, next. So this is, again, something I did last year, but I've, I've updated it a bit. So Maryland and Maryland Homeowners Association spent 100 grand trying to destroy this Howard County pollinator garden. Homeowners were Janet and Jeff Crouch. They fought back. They saved their garden and inspired the passage of a state law in the process. And Janet is Nancy Lawson's sister. I mean, many of you know Nancy. So HB 322 went into effect October 1, 2021. And the law says that HOAs cannot require homeowners to plant turf grass and may not impose or act to impose on reasonable limitations on low impact landscaping. And one of the definitions of low impact landscaping is pollinator gardens and other features designed to attract pollinator species. And bottom line is the law codifies the right to have pollinator habitat gardens and specifically encourages attracting wildlife and pollinators. So any of you that live in an area under an HOA, if they start harassing you, remind them of this. So the New York Times recently ran this story and they, they called it, they fought the lawn and the lawn lost. Mm -hmm. It was also run in the Baltimore Sun and overseas in England in the Daily Mail. CNN interviewed Nancy and her sister and they called it fighting lawn enforcement. Is this the end of the manicured lawn? And Nancy has on her website as butterflies one, bullies zero. And finally, Nancy has an article in Butterfly Gardener magazine titled Defending Your Garden, Your Garden Borders, Eight Tips for Working in HOAs and Weed Inspectors. So very important point here, and keep it in mind if you want to plant a pollinator garden. Next. All right, reducing mosquito spray. And Robin talked about this early. Um, I was really ecstatic to hear what he was saying. Um, basically, mosquito spray kills everything. Mosquitoes, fireflies, butterflies, bees, beetles, fruit bugs. Moths, dragonflies, everything it hits. Uh, they'll, they'll tell you it's a, similar to a naturally occurring substance, it's chrysanthemum, but it's more toxic and lasts longer in the environment, and they typically respray every three weeks. So, alternatives are remove or drain sources of standing water, use BTI mosquito dumps, 
um, which basically are naturally occurring bacterium found in soils. Um, you can uh, use repellents or DEET on yourself when you go out or long sleeves. Um, so some people, for some people, mosquito-free yard is worth the buy kill. Uh, but you should make the decision to spray your yard informed of the potential costs and the benefits. And a lot of times when they spray your neighbor's yard, if it's windy, that spray goes into your yard. And there's been some lawsuits about that. Um, so it's something to keep in mind as well. So a lot of the fireflies, butterflies, and bees are in trouble and decreasing the amount of spraying is one thing you can do. The next. So enhance the wild in your garden. Um, it, it's an oasis for bees, butterflies, and birds. You can register with Bee City and get this sign. Um, you can report butterfly sightings to the butterfly survey and then sit back and enjoy the show. Okay, next. So every year we do a butterfly of the year. Um, we knew what was going to be the butterfly of the year in August this year. So again, uh, if you look at the distribution on the right, in 2014, we had seven harvesters. They were the first harvesters adults seen in the county since 1996. So it had been you know, 18 years between sightings of harvester adults. And over the next seven years, we had 11 total. So they were hard to find. And this year we had 14. Um, it was, you know, 14 is not a lot, but it felt like <laughs> a ton. Um, so anyway, and then here's the other shot of the harvester chrysalis in the lower right that Bonnie found. Um, think about how hard that was to find. She also had pictures of harvester caterpillars and with the aphids. You remember harvester is the only um, Butterfly or butterfly or moth that uh, eats anything but plants, basically. It's, it's carnivorous. Again, the uh, Annette's photo in the upper left, is, which is just ridiculous. It's so good. And then I managed to catch one with its wings open so you could see um, the dorsal side of it, which is pretty unusual for that butterfly. So, next. All right, educational materials. So, um, we, you know, we got Dick Smith's up in the upper right, Dick Smith's Butterflies of Howard County that needs an update. Uh, the Butterfly Identification Cheat Sheet in the lower right. The uh, Butterfly Flight Times Graph, which I think Jennifer Hare Street gets an example that we did last winter. Early and late dates from last winter. Um, overwintering strategies that we talked about. Um, the annual Butterfly Year presentation, which is what this is. Uh, again, pollinator garden design templates and spreadsheet, the butterfly photo gallery that, that uh, Bob does a great job with, the butterfly walks, the annual report, which will be in your March, April newsletter, and of course, the last butterfly of the year contest. So everything in blue is on the website, and they're all, most of them at least, are in PDFs, so you can download them to the phone, your phone and take them in the field with you. Uh, so if you see a butterfly and you think it may be too late or too early, you can download the early late dates to your phone and, and check it right away. So we have butterfly year status emails. We put out six or seven of those this year. And the distribution for that is over 275 people at this point. We have butterfly talks, butterfly ID emails. So if anybody does, is, has found a butterfly and is not sure what it is, we encourage them just to send us the photo and we'll let them know. And of course, we recognize the first identified butterfly of the year. So next, so we get near the end. So anybody who's sleeping at this point, it's time to wake up. Um, so we continue surveying our, our survey goals and actions, continue surveying, continue building the long-term trends. Again, find new locations for rare species like the broadwing skipper or the silver, silvery checker spot, those types. Look for additional areas of specialized habitat. Try to locate additional new species or species with low detectability, as Dave Zilkowski calls it. Encourage new participants, continue to have walks, talks, and classes. Encourage people to send in photos. Uh, develop additional educational materials. Again, this winter, we're hoping for a host plant list. Update the butterflies of Howard County. And I'm putting together a list of trees and shrubs for bees as well. Um, put together a rare butterfly alert or listserv, um, so we get the word out there. Um, more quickly, encourage the planting of pollinator gardens that we talked about. And this one, this next, next second to last one's a tough nut to crack. Work with different agencies, county government, et cetera, about mowing schedules and use of pesticide and herbicide 
and the protection of key habitat areas. That, that's one I really want to get into, but that one's going to be a tough one. So, Kevin, I talked to uh, Brian Moody because we have the same issue with the uh, the grassland stuff. He did say that he would be willing to uh, take a fact sheet and distribute it within the county to people to advise them on best practices. So it, it okay. needs to be a start, something we would endorse. Yeah. And we're, we're on Peace City, we're working on that. I uh, haven't quite gotten to the point where we have it totally written down. But they're willing um, to. Yeah, that's great. Okay. okay. Good to know. Hey, Thank you. Uh, Kevin, this, this is Kurt. Uh, there is also a bill in front of the General Assembly this year that would address mowing under power rights of way that would also advance our goals. So stay tuned for that. Okay, thank you. Yes. And of course, the last one is educate the next generation of butterfly leaders in the county continuing Dick's tradition. So next, that one's it. So thank you. So any questions? Uh, can I make a few observations, please, Kurt? Sure. Uh, in terms of uh, spraying for mosquitoes, uh, the concern has been, uh, well, let's put it this way. Uh, broadcast spraying of communities done by the state is not going away anytime soon because of overinflated fears of West Nile, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, right now, the push is to get any per and polyfluorinated uh, so-called forever chemicals that seem to be contaminating these mosquito sprays removed therefrom. But uh, we're not having mosquito spraying going away anytime real soon. Uh, if you have to mow your lawn, uh, battery-powered lawnmowers have gotten rather inexpensive and uh, they're light and self-propelled uh, by two batteries. And you can do any regular sized lawn with one of those without spewing uh, hydrocarbons and, and what have you uh, uh, from your lawnmower. I, before we moved into our place where we no longer have to mow the lawn because somebody else does it, I got one of those and it worked very, very well. Ego, and I forget some of the other manufacturers. Uh, you can get them at, uh, you know, Ace or Home Despot or wherever. All right, thanks for that, Kurt. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I might, add, I might add that some of the uh, sprays they use for mosquitoes, uh, community sprays, are extremely toxic to uh, very small blue crabs. So they're actually damaging the blue crab fishery on the eastern shore quite seriously by um, spraying the marshes, but they don't listen to that. And yet they worry about the fact the blue crab population is crashing. So two and two equals four. Yeah, anything like that helps. So appreciate that, Gail. Anybody Hi, else? Kevin. This is uh, Kelsey, if you can yeah. hear me. I was sure. wondering if, with the warm days that we had in January so far, do we have a first butterfly of the year yet? We, we looked, <laughs> didn't find any though. It, it, it turns out those warm days were somewhat cloudy. So it, it's better if it's, you know, mid sixties, sunny and no wind. Uh, we didn't quite get all three of those, but there were several of us out looking anyway. Uh, one of these years, I really want to have the first butterfly of the year before this talk. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. It's so nice to be back after three years. Yes. It's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. Yes. Yeah. How many people were in person? How many here tonight? Yeah, at, at Robinson. 26, somebody said? Yeah, in person was 28 uh, at home. Oh, very good. Very good. How many? Uh, 26, 26 here and 28 on Zoom. Okay, great. Yeah. Very good. I have, uh, walk there. If I may, I have a little monarch story to relate. Sure. Um, I haven't done much at the bird club in several years, but I, I'm a birder in my yard. So this <laughs> October or September, I had a very spindly 
um, swamp milkweed in the front yard because I have pollinator yard for stuff in the front yard. So long story short, I go out there and I find eight to 10 caterpillars, monarch. And I'm like thrilled. I was a school teacher and I'm like thrilled, right? So I'm thinking they are going to strip this little Charlie Brown milkweed thing in no time flat. Well, they did. So I got a little cage. I had one from school when we had the butterfly program in school. I put them in there. I collect, I came down here and collected milkweed leaves from here and brought them back to my house. And then I got my seven-year-old twin grandsons involved and they were collecting, but you know, the leaves and bring them to me. So I watched and watched and watched them. I had my neighbor babysit them when I left because they had gone into the, you know, the hard chrysalis and turned black. And I thought, well, if I'm not here, you're not going to get out. So anyway, long story short. So it was so exciting. It was like giving birth. It was like, you know, like these eight, these eight little creatures came out and I brought them back down here. So if I left them in my yard, I thought, you know, there's a lot of traffic. Oh, there's not much to eat. So I brought them back down here, let them go on two or three different occasions. And then I had one holdout that my grandsons adopted. So they had to collect leaves again. And that darn thing didn't, didn't go into maturity and, and emerge until about the 10th of October. Wow. Yeah. It was late. And then yeah. we had cold nights. And I thought, <laughs> no, it, it made it. It made it. So, but it was so thrilling. Yeah. It's just great. Just great. Great story. Thanks. Um, butterflies have little tails, and the other ones don't. Like, <laughs> yeah, like the yellow, like the yellow, they have it's longer at the end, and then some of them just seem to be round. Yeah, some of them like swallowtails have tails, yeah. and hair streaks have tails, just way they're way they're built, basically. Yeah. Well, I think it also is a distraction for a predator. Yeah. Like, yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. 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 But, uh, yeah, one alternative to lawns is our upper lawn. Our, we have dogs and our dog lawn, we have to sort of keep as mostly grass and grass and leaves. But I'm trying to turn my upper lawn into violets. Yes. Sooner or later, a fertility is going to come along <laughs> and find my violets. And we leave the leaves. I don't have to worry about that. I've got the violets already. Oh, yeah. A lot of us have violets already. Well, we have lots of violets, but I mean, you know, they in other words, the violets have precedent over the grass. So that's oh god, yes. It, I mean that's awesome. The fritillaries, thank you. I wanted to ask um about the phragmite. I always thought that was I was under the impression that it was kind of a useless plant. It was just taking over acres and acres of New Jersey and marshland mm -hmm. and whatever. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned tonight that one of the butterflies yeah. actually uses it. As Broad, a host plant. Broadwing skipper. It's one of the few um, non-native plants that are native butterflies have adopted as a host plant. Interesting. Yeah. Well, the other thing is there's all, actually two, um, I don't know what you would call, uh, genetic uh, varieties of Phragmites, and there is a native Phragmites, which doesn't grow large, and it doesn't in gulf huge areas of wetland and possibly this skipper was eventually uh, originally uh, fed upon that okay. it was not a common plant it's been completely out maneuvered by the uh, invasive but uh, there is a native phragmites okay good to know thanks yeah there, there's a similar analogy with the uh, the Alanthus, uh, moth that uh, i forget what the original host plant was but it has wholesale adopted the uh, invasive uh, Olanthus, uh, so-called tree of heaven. Right. As a host plant. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of tree of heaven, has anyone seen any spotted lantern flies? Yes. Yeah. I have one in my yard. Where, where was that? Elgin City. Elgin City, okay. okay. Yeah, Bonnie, Bonnie's had them. Um, I think Bill Hill had one as well. So they're here. Yeah, I know. I just hadn't seen one. I'm living just below the Howard County border, Montgomery County. I hadn't seen any, and we're out all the time. And I keep seeing Alanthus trees, and I keep looking for the egg cases, but I haven't seen any yet. You know, knock on wood, right? 
Yeah, I, I had uh, gone up to Chesapeake City to meet a friend of mine for lunch, and there were several of them flying up there. And I saw their flight pattern, and a week later, I came home and saw the same flight pattern. So I followed it, and sure enough. Yeah. So, Kevin, I, uh, somebody gave me a, a, what I thought was a helianthus. It turned out to be a Jerusalem artichoke. <laughs> that thing's taking over my brain. I was already to pull it out. So what you're telling me is that's a good host plant and I should leave it there. Yeah, right. silver checker spot. It's it's not a bad pollinator plant either. So oh god, yes, yeah, to get the <laughs> Jerusalem artichoke. Anybody else? <laughs> okay, well thank you everyone. Thank you so much, Kevin.